could not be more excited about jumping into uh, this collection of talks uh, under the title Epicenter. And we chose that title Epicenter because a lot of theologians believe that Romans is the, the best book in the Bible, the most important book, maybe the most significant book in the Bible, maybe the most significant letter ever written in literature. And a lot of theologians will get more specific and say that Romans chapter 8 is the most important or the highlight chapter in the book of Romans. Thus, someone like a John Piper would say Romans chapter 8 is the most important chapter in the Bible. And that's a pretty huge statement. But once we unpack and work our way through this text, I think you're going to understand why a lot of people would say that about Romans 8. But before we dive in today, and obviously over these next few weeks, it's just all about the Word. It is every Sunday here, but we just want to get into the Word, and we want to see what God is speaking to us. And we have a huge prayer over this collection that not only will we learn things, that is important, but that we'll be transformed by things. So the idea here isn't that we'll get into a seminary class and we'll all get a cool nugget about Romans 8. The idea is that we'll agree with what God is saying and our lives will be transformed. That's the prayer that we're praying for you and that's the power of this word. I was reminded, and we've said this a lot of times at Passion City, but in ancient times when the scripture was being copied, so... The the Torah would come, the first books of the Bible, and then over time, that manuscript would begin to wear out, and a scribe would copy that manuscript to a new copy. And when that scribe would be working through an Old Testament text and come to the name Yahweh, the scribe would put their pen down, leave their post, go to a ritual cleansing bath, something like what we would think of as a hot tub shaped thing. They would undress themselves, go into the ritual cleansing bath, come out of the ritual cleansing bath, dress themselves again, come back to their post, get a new pen, and write the name Yahweh. If Yahweh was in the next line of the text, they would put the pen down, leave their post, go to the cleansing station, cleanse themselves, come back to the post, get a new pen, and write Yahweh again. And so when we hold this today... And no one has to go to the cleansing bath. No one needs to put the pen down today. Uh, Most of us or a lot of us are going to read it on our phone. But I want us to have that same attitude of heart today. That this is the living, breathing, holy word of God. And it has the power to transform your life. And so in that spirit today, I want us to come to Romans chapter 8. And I want us to open our minds and say, Dear Lord God Almighty, thank you for the miracle of this word. We agree with what it says of itself, that it is God-breathed. And so we hold it with gratitude today. We hold it with expectation today. We are not here to look down on the word. We are here today to put our lives under the word. And so Holy Spirit, as you stirred it up in the hearts of men and women who wrote it down so that we could hold it today, I pray that you will stir it up again. And that you will do exactly what you desire to do. And I thank you that we can all have confidence in that. Your word accomplishes the purpose for which it is sent. And it is going to be sent right now. Across these rooms and across this city and across the world and into prisons and who knows where. And I thank you that everywhere it goes is going to do what you have sent it to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 8, verse 1, says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Now, just again, we mentioned this last week, but feel free to interact with the text, okay? I know I'm reading and you're listening and it feels like class, but um, it's the living word of God. So if, for, for example, it, it strikes you that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, and you know that you're in Christ Jesus, and that's something that really is a delightful thought to you, then feel free. If not, it's okay as well. And, you know... So I'll start again. Please don't clap this time because I hate it when people clap after you talk to them about clapping. But sometime in the future, just keep that in mind. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he, God, condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. Now, the chapter opens with therefore. And we know that whenever something opens with therefore, you have to ask what it is there for. And so that means, typically, that you have to rewind and understand what is the foundation that is allowing us now to make this big pronouncement, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. How can we say that? What are we standing on when we make that claim? And to understand that, you have to go back to the beginning. And to go back to the beginning would take a lot of time, but let's do it quickly. The Word of God has a few main purposes. The first main purpose of the Word of God is to tell us what God's purposes for life are. So if you want to know why you're on planet Earth and what your life is all about, what life is all about, the Word of God tells you that. But the Word of God also tells us that there is a problem, not only that there are plans and purposes, but secondly, that there is a problem, and the problem is man's sin. The third thing the Scripture tells us or gives us a clear image of is the plan of God to restore man to him. And then the last big purpose of God's Word is to show us how God is in the process of perfecting all things. So God has a plan. There's a problem called man's sin. Or God has a purpose. There's a problem called man's sin. But then God has a plan to reconnect man, sinful man, to himself. And then ultimately God's big purpose plan that we see in Scripture is to perfect all things, including you and me and the world and the heavens and everything else. So let's just break that down a little bit. What is the, the big purpose? The purpose is paradise with God. That was the purpose. It's, it's being created by God and for God, so you have Adam and Eve in the garden with God. That was the plan and the purpose. But then there was a problem, and the problem was sin, and sin simply is my way over God's way. And it's not simply about a transaction like I did this and I wasn't supposed to do that. Or made this choice and I was really supposed to make that choice. That's not really at the heart of sin. At the heart of sin, it's not transactional, it's personal. Adam and Eve didn't trust the intentions of God. It wasn't that they did what he asked them not to do. It was that they didn't trust him. And they didn't trust his heart. And they didn't trust his intentions for their life. So I just want to make sure that's super clear today. We're not here to give you a list of things that God says you can do or you can't do, you should do or you shouldn't do, and life is just about doing the transactional thing right. No, life is about trusting God. That he loves you. He is for you. He has your best in mind. He is wanting to give you more, not take away from you so that you will have less. He's not trying to rob you. He's trying to bless you. 
He's not trying to prevent you. He is trying to accelerate your perfection until the moment that you see him face to face. But here we all are today, all of us in the wake of Adam and Eve's sin, but we're all adding to it pretty well on our own. Amen? No? Amen? And so a lot of us can identify with the therefore. When you rewind from chapter 8 and you come to the end of chapter 7, you get some thoughts that I think a lot of us will relate to. Paul said, I do not understand what I do. Just show of hands. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Which is true, but it's also a nice way of pointing the finger somewhere else. It's not me, it's the sin that's in there that's doing it. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. Hello? But I cannot carry it out. You're like, I've, why have I not been memorizing this passage? This is my story. <laughs> For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I do the evil that I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. In other words, whatever happened in the garden now has a domino effect going into all of humanity, and I am in that domino effect. I am now in the line of sin. I am now adding to it by my own choices, but I was born into it as well. There is a powerful law working in me, and it is called sin, and it is a problem. And Paul understands this. And so he says, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. And then out of desperation, who will rescue me from this body that's got all this sin going on in its sinful nature that's causing me to do all the things that I don't want to do and not do all the things that I do want to do And I keep on doing that even though I don't want to do that. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he obviously is teeing us up for the gospel. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So purpose with God in paradise, a problem, man's sin, But then we see in Scripture the plan. And what is the plan? The plan is that there would be a divine exchange in our lives that would free us from the penalty 
of our sin. Now what Paul is saying is that there are laws working in life. There is the law of the spirit and there is the law of the flesh. There is the law of God that our minds can come around and there is the law of sin that our flesh wants to coalesce around, that is in us and in our flesh. What what he's saying ultimately is what that the great church father Bob Dylan said, you might serve the devil or you might serve the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. And there might be somebody in this gathering today, and you're like, okay, great, so I've got sin in my flesh, maybe it started with Adam and Eve, I don't know, but I do know that I do things I don't want to do, and I don't do things I do want to do, but you know what, that's just life, and you make choices, you roll on, what's the big deal, I'm just deciding what I want to do, and yeah, I don't do the right thing all the time, but what's the big deal? The big deal is you were still created by and for God, and there's going to be a reckoning in your life when you come to God at the end of your life. The scripture says all things are from him, all things are through him, and all things are to him. That's what Romans is telling us in another place. So even if your mindset is, hey, I'm not really you know, hurting people, and I'm just making decisions, and they're not all, all great decisions, but that's just me, it's my life, and I'm rolling through and living my life. What's the big deal with that? The big deal with that is you are on a collision course with the God who made you, And that God isn't relative, he's holy. And when holiness meets sinfulness, it isn't pretty. And that's called the wrath of God. It's not God wanting to be mean to you. It's God's holiness meeting up with your sinfulness. And that's a reality that is in the therefore. If you go way, way back... To Romans 1, and we're going to get to Romans 8 eventually, but I I just need us to have the therefore. Romans 1 says, the wrath of God, there it is, is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about him is plain to them. In other words, all you have to do is wake up and look around the world and you go, oh, there is a God. Uh, You might not know his name. You may not know his character. You may not know exactly what his purposes and plans are. But anybody who looks around planet Earth can see that beauty and order do not come out of chaos and nothing. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. You say, well, how? For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, and here's where it gets kind of dicey. You're like, well, I'm just going to go my own way. I'm just going to make my own decisions. I don't really need to really factor in God in my equation. Well, the problem with that is if you choose and insist On doing it your own way, God will let you do it your own way. Therefore, the therefore goes back to all this business. God gave them over. In the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged... The truth of God for a lie. And worshiped. You're like, whoa, they just exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Surely they're not going to worship. Oh, no, they're going to worship. Because we're all going to worship. You're going to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. And you're going to worship because you were created to worship. You were made to worship. They worshiped, though, and served Thank you, Bob Dylan. 
created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. But then there is a plan. Purpose, paradise with God. Problem, sin, plan. God had a divine exchange in mind. The innocent he would give for the guilty so that the guilty could become innocent in him. Jesus said it this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. God exchanged his son for sinful man. That whoever believes in him, and this is not just mental assent. We, we need to really understand that today. This is not just, oh, I believe in God. Oh, I believe in Jesus. That's not really what belief means here. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. But check out the next verse. No one's ever holding this up at Super Bowls. John 3, 17. But maybe we should start adding it in. Because it's powerful and it's what the world needs to hear. For God did not send his son into the world to, and here's our word from Romans 8, to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And why didn't Jesus come to condemn the world? He says in the next verse, for whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of of God's one and only Son. In other words, wrath is their future. So Jesus doesn't need to come and say, wrath. Jesus is coming to say, you already got wrath in your future. So I don't need to give you more wrath. I've come to give you life. I didn't come to condemn you, but to save you. Because if you don't have me, you're already condemned. It's already coming. Your verdict is already in. But I've come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. So, now we come to Romans 8. Therefore, therefore, because God has a purpose for your life, even though you have a problem called sin, he had a plan to reconcile you to himself even though you had sin, and he has the power to ultimately perfect you through Christ in the end. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus... The law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. I am not going to hell. A. And I am not under condemnation one second of my life on earth. There is... Now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, condemnation, I think simply put, means to be declared unfit for use or service. You ever rolling through kind of a left-behind part of town, and you see an, a building that's all boarded up, and there's a notice on the front of it, and it says, Condemned. In other words, this building is unfit for use or service, and most likely its future is what? Going to be torn down. So for somebody today, you're like, I don't know, we've been through a whole lot of scripture already, and there's a lot of therefores going on. Uh, what, what is the main point here? Well, for someone today, it is this. The enemy has been speaking to you, and he's been telling you that you are unfit. For use or service. Oh, God doesn't have any interest in you. Oh, you would never be useful to God. Oh, you're never going to have a significant role in God's story. Not you. Because of A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, you are unfit for use or service in the kingdom and economy of God. Now, 
and forever. And God is saying to you today, that's the enemy's voice. That's the voice of a liar, not the voice of someone who exchanged his innocent son for you. In Christ, you can be fit for use or service. And in Christ, God will never come to tear you down. The enemy, oh man, he's got the bulldozer cranked up in the street. And all he wants to do is just completely scrape you off the foundation. But there's a therefore in our story. And now there is no condemnation. But it's, it's specifically for some people. So here we go with the fact that the, the gospel is narrow. Anyone can come through the door of the gospel. Hello? Anybody. But it's a, it's a little door. Anyone can come through it, but it's a little door. And I'll show you why it's important that it's a little door in a minute. But there's no condemnation for those who are what? Who are in Christ Jesus. That's who's not condemned. Those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, it doesn't say um, there's no condemnation for those who are in the church. Nope. It doesn't say there's no condemnation for those who are in a denomination. Oh, we're, we're Lutherans. Well, fantastic. <laughs> it doesn't say that there's no condemnation to those who have got religion. It doesn't say there's no condemnation to those who uh, pray to prayer. You're like, well, we do that at Passion City. I know. But it's important that you know that you, you can't just base your whole eternity and your life on earth by going, I raised my hand at the end of the gathering and I prayed along with the pastor. Well, did you understand that prayer? Did you onboard that prayer? And now can you unpack that prayer? And are you walking out that prayer? And do you know the implications of that prayer? Because the implications of that true faith, if that's what was in that prayer, is that you are now in Christ. So it's not that you're in a church, in a denomination, that you prayed a prayer, that you tried your best. I tried my best, Father. Great. A lot of people who tried their best have condemnation at the end of their story. Uh, I was a good person. Yes, but were you perfect? Were you holy? Were you without fault? Well, no, but I was a good person. I believed in God. But what kind of belief? Mental belief, like I believed in George Washington? Or belief of faith where I put all my hope on him for salvation. It doesn't say that there's no condemnation for those who were in church, for those who believed in God, for those who were a good person, tried their best, prayed a prayer, had religion, were part of some denomination. It says there's no condemnation at the end of the day for those who are in Christ. So obviously there's a big question looming over the gathering right now. And that is, are you in Christ? It's about, ultimately, your position more than it's about your performance that gets you no condemnation. The no condemnation isn't connected to your performing. It's connected to your position. And we'll see that really clearly Performing is about the law. And the law couldn't do it. This is what we read. Verse 3. For what the law, that's, let's put it down as simple as the Ten Commandments, was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. So there wasn't a problem with the law. There was just a problem with us. 
what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. In other words, Obeying the law can't get us out of the problem. In fact, the law just reminds us that we have a problem. The law isn't the pathway to get out of our sin. The law just reminds us that we have a problem called sin. That's what Uh, Paul was saying in Romans 7, 7, he said, I would have not known what sin was had it not been for the law. See, the law is good, but the law has a counteracting influence called sinful flesh. And so the law couldn't do it. So I love the way this comes down in this verse. It's so powerful. Notice what he says, for what the law was powerless to do, God did. Can you just say God did? God did? We don't do a lot of this at Passion City, but can you tell your neighbor God did? God did. God did. The law was powerless to do, but God did. I was powerless to do, but God did. You were powerless to do, but God did. This is the gospel. God did. Not I did, God did. Not I can, God can. Not what I did, but what God did, God did. The law couldn't do, God did. God did. We've we've talked about this so many times, but if you want to simply explain what we're celebrating today to somebody, it's this. The law was powerless to do. Do, do. And a lot of people, that's their whole message of getting to God. It's what you do. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this a certain number of times. You got to do this a certain way. You got to do this in a certain place. You got to do. It's what you do. And that's why a lot of people say, well, I feel okay because I'm a pretty good person. You know, I'm doing pretty good. I, it's what you do. But I'm telling you, you can't do anything to get into the presence of a perfect God. So you need to forget the any in anything, and you need to get on board with the any. Not the any. You hear my voice? The any. Not the any, the any. Can you say that with me? Not the any, but the any. Do you understand? Can you hear? You got the little difference there? Can, can you say it? Not the any, but the any. the any. The any is what we're looking for. You're looking for the any. Not the any. What, what else can I add? What else can I do? What, what more can I say? Is there anything else I can do to make this right with God? You're not looking for the any. You're looking for the any. I'll show you. The any. The any. You're looking for the any. The any. This is religion, and this is grace. What the law was powerless to do, God did. So it's done. You're like, well, how how did he do it? Well, he says how he did it um, right here. It says what the law was powerless to do, God did. Well, how did he do it? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned. Notice that the condemnation didn't go away. The condemnation just got redirected. And it went from you to Christ. So God didn't just say one day, you know what? Everybody's tried really hard, so let's just scrap that whole righteousness and holiness thing. And let's just start all over again. No, he didn't do that because he's a just God. 
He said, there has to be a payment for the problem of man's sin. So I need a man who I can put sin on. Therefore, I need an innocent man so that I can put the sin of man on an innocent man and the condemnation that was coming your way is going to go his way. So he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. What does that mean? It means if somebody asked me, well, were you ever holy? I'd be like, no, I wasn't. But now in Christ, I am. Were you ever deserving of a place with a righteous God? No, I was not. But now in Christ I am. I checked that box. Were you ever perfect? No. But praise God, I am in Christ, and He is. And so I have been made perfect in Christ. I'm still working that out in my flesh, but I've already positionally been made perfect in Christ. The righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit that's what it says later in the chapter and I gotta cruise through this and wrap this up but it says what shall we say in response to these things if God is for us we all love this part of Romans 8 by the way verse 31 who can be against us But this is all in the context of what we've just been talking about. In other words, if God has taken the condemnation that was coming my way and put it on Christ in human flesh, then who's going to come against me with anything? Because if he's for me, who's going to be against me? This isn't just like, you know, conflict resolution scripture. This is an eternal position scripture. If God's for me, who's going to be against me? If God's for us, who's going to be against us? He, and here it comes, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, his son, graciously give us all things? If he's already given you Jesus, trust me, he's not going to hold back in giving you every good thing he has. How will he not graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus died more than that. Christ Jesus who died More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So the question is, who can condemn? The answer is, no one. Why? Because God has justified. And that takes us last text and we'll close. It takes us back to Romans 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. One of the most famous verses in the Bible. Unfortunately, it's not a verse in the Bible. It's a part of a verse in the Bible. Yes, it has a number by it, but it also has a comma at the end of it. It is the most glorious comma. I would hear people growing up, when I finally clued into some of this a little bit, I'd hear somebody say, well, you know, the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. <laughs> comma! <laughs> Please, with the comma. They'd be like, comma? <laughs> yes. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
The end. No. Comma. Men, celebrate punctuation, people. <laughs> if that right there was a period and that was our story, go write some worship songs about that. But hallelujah for that guy. And what a beautiful conjunction. Are all justified for free by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All are justified. We just read that. It is God who justifies. So here, here, here's the crazy thing. Your label now in Christ is not, not condemned. You're not walking around going, not condemned. Don't come against me. Don't even think about coming against me. Not condemned. Not condemned. Not condemned. No, 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 no. Not condemned. Thank you very much. Not condemned. Put, putting that sign on me. Not condemned. Being, being shut the bulldozer off. Not condemned. That is not my label in Christ. My label in Christ is justified. Justified. The way I learned it was just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. In Christ. Justified. So I'm walking around and I'm like, I'm justified. Oh, yes, I was guilty, but I'm justified. The verdict is in. Not guilty. And you stand behind that table, you got your attorney, your brother, your sister in law, and you're like, but it's not because my lawyer put on a good presentation, it's not because ultimately I didn't do it. It's because another man walked into the courtroom and they gave him my sentence. <laughs> Justify. So the questions today are, and you're like, what is all that stuff over there? Don't pay any attention to that. We'll talk about that on another day. <laughs> the question today is, are you in Christ? Dear God, I'm asking you, are you in Christ? You're like, I'm in church. Great. Doesn't count. It's good. But it's not going to get you out of condemnation. Are you in Christ? And if you were not in Christ, please, I implore you, receive the grace of God in Christ today. Confess your sin. Admit it to God. Turn away from it in repentance. And run to God. Who is waiting to put his arms around you. To lavish his grace and love on you. To say, I forgive you. And I wipe your slate clean. And I put my spirit in you so that you got a new law that you can live by. And that is the law of the spirit of Christ who is in you. Are you in Christ? Because if you're not in Christ, you have nothing to stand between you and the wrath But if you are in Christ, Christ already bore it. The cross was about physical death. But that really wasn't the point. Yes, he had to die. What happened on the cross was spiritual. 
when the wrath of God was poured out on an innocent son. And he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because of her. But because of your obedience, I'll never have to forsake her. I'll never have to forsake him. I will never have to forsake him. I will never forsake him.